fellow redeemed. If I were to ask you to give me a description of the perfect pastor, what would you include? That's a question that was taken of a number of churchgoers. They compiled all the results, and it turns out that these are some of the characteristics of the perfect pastor. The perfect pastor preaches sermons that are exactly 11 minutes long. The perfect pastor works from 6 a.m. till midnight while also serving as the church janitor. The perfect pastor loves to work with the teenagers and give his full attention to the senior citizens. The perfect pastor makes 15 evangelism calls a day, never misses a meeting, and is always available in his office in case you drop by to chat. The perfect pastor is 29 years old and has 40 years of experience. The perfect pastor always remembers everybody's name, including your aunt who came once. The perfect pastor is also handsome. So is that your idea of a perfect pastor? Have you ever even met this guy? <laughs> yeah, me neither. But really, all of that gives us an opportunity to think a little bit about what we would want a pastor to be, what we expect a pastor to do and be. And you realize that is not just idle discussion, especially here at Mount Olive, because in four weeks from now, we're going to install a brand new pastor. So what are you going to expect from that man? What do you want him to be like? And, and maybe more importantly, will your expectations for that man match God's expectations? In fact, what are God's expectations? Does God have any qualifications for being a pastor? Yes, he does. In fact, he records them right here through the Apostle Paul. And so it's fitting for us, especially considering four weeks from now we're going to install a pastor and two weeks later four more teachers, it's fitting that we spend a little time today looking at what we might call God-given qualifications for ministers of the gospel. We'll see both what they are and why God has established these qualifications. Our text for today is taken from the first letter to Timothy. Last week we heard from the second letter. They're both written by Paul, the older pastor, to his younger son in the faith, Timothy, offering advice on what it means to be a pastor, both to Timothy and really to his congregation, and therefore to our congregation too. Paul begins by saying, Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. The Greek word translated as overseer, sometimes translated as bishop, refers to somebody who's in authority. Um, oftentimes a parallel word is used, translated as elder. Um, scripture says, for example, that the elders direct the affairs of the church and are those whose work is preaching and teaching. And although that could apply to maybe a number of different positions in a church, really it's best embodied by a parish pastor. And so what Paul is saying is, if anyone uh, desires or sets his heart on being a pastor, he desires a noble task. Which is true. If a, if a young man, you know, has his heart set on being a pastor, that's a good thing. I can't think of a, a career that is more fulfilling than being a full-time public minister of the gospel. I get to share the gospel all the time. But just wanting to be a pastor does not necessarily qualify you to be a pastor. God actually says there's a whole bunch of criteria that must be met to, to become or to remain a pastor. And, and Paul lists them here. For example, he says, 
an overseer must be above reproach. And that doesn't mean, obviously, that a pastor must be sinless or we wouldn't have any pastors. It means that a pastor cannot be guilty of a, a grave moral lapse. He, he can't have done something that so destroys his reputation that he can no longer serve as a representative of God and the church. He must be blameless. Paul goes on, the pastor must be the husband of but one wife. That doesn't mean he has to be married. Paul was a bachelor his whole life. What it means maybe is better understood if we take these words literally in the Greek. It literally says he must be a, a one-woman man. In other words, if he's married, he needs to be faithful to that one woman. He can't be a womanizer. Obviously, he can't be a guilty of adultery. If he is and he repents, God would forgive him. He'd still be a Christian. But likely, he could no longer be a pastor. He goes on, kind of lumps three of them together. He must be temperate, self-controlled, and respectable. Temperate means more than he can't be a drunk. It, it means he, he must be in control of his emotions. It ties with being self-controlled. He must be even-keeled. He, he can't let his emotions get the best of him. You might say he must be level-headed. And finally, he must be respectable. Um, another translation is orderly. He must, he must have his life in, in order. Uh, he can't be a slob. Shouldn't be boorish. When I was at the seminary, they said, you've you got to be a, a gentleman, both with people you know and people you don't know, which leads to the next one. A pastor is to be hospitable. Uh, the Greek word here literally means you are to be a lover of strangers, a, a friend of foreigners. It's the idea that a pastor needs to be welcoming to, to guests, whether they're in his home or they're in his church. Now you realize all those characteristics are not limited to pastors. Right? These are things that God wants every Christian to be. It's not like God says, well, you know, as long as you're not a pastor, you can be a total jerk. <laughs> no, this is what God demands of, of all of us. There are, however, some characteristics, some qualifications that apply only to pastors. And the next one is one of those. A pastor must be able to teach. I mean, you think about that. God does not require that of every Christian. God doesn't say you must be able to communicate the gospel in order, in order to believe the gospel. You, your, your teaching methods could be gobbledygook, and you could still believe that Jesus is your Savior. On the other hand, for somebody that has been called into this office of pastor, if... if, if if a person's going to do what a pastor or teacher does, well, that means we have to be able to communicate effectively with our fellow human beings. As a pastor, I, I don't have to know how to you know, do heart surgery or change the brakes on my car, but I do have to be able to communicate the gospel in a meaningful way. In fact, that's why at seminary we, we have classes on education. In fact, there are sometimes, every once in a while, you'll have a, a seminary student who is asked by the faculty to no longer continue because it's determined that he just doesn't have the ability to teach. Now, from there, Paul goes back to some of those character traits that God is, is looking for. He says, a pastor must not be given to drunkenness, right? Can't, can't be addicted to alcohol. Not violent, but gentle, both in his words and in his actions. He can't be uh, 
badgering people. He can't be a bully, not quarrelsome. And then finally, he can't be a lover of money. Scripture, all the warnings it says about the, the danger of loving money applies to more than just pastors. It applies to all of us. Now, in addition to that whole list of character traits, he also adds kind of two what I'll call um, circumstances in life issues. He says, for example, a pastor must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. He actually then goes on to explain why that is when he says, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Obviously, there's a correlation between a family in, in our home and a family here at church. Both require discipline. Both require unconditional love. The second circumstance in life, he must not be a recent convert. In other words, a, a pastor can't be you know, new to the Christian faith. Now, in, in the Wisconsin Synod, our, our worker training system kind of takes care of that one for us automatically. You, you can't make it through four years of MLC and then four years of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and still be a recent convert. You're in it eight years already. Now, from there, Paul kind of circles back to kind of fill the loop by going back to the beginning and saying he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. While you just think for a minute about that entire list, and you realize, wow, God, God has set some pretty high expectations for his called workers. Why? I mean, is, does God want to set up this kind of two-tiered system you know, we've got, we've got the regular people, you know, relatively holy, and then you've got the super holy pastors and teachers. No. Why does God set high expectations? It's all about God wanting to safeguard His Word. God wants nothing to get in the way of people being able to hear and believe His Word. And so just to make sure that nobody's tripping over the behavior of the pastors and teachers, just to make sure that the messengers aren't getting in the way of the message, God sets high standards for those who are proclaiming the gospel. That's exactly what Paul means when, when he wrote, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. You see, that's what Paul was concerned about. That he didn't do or say anything that would somehow detract from the life-giving message that he was proclaiming. You realize that the same thing is still true for your called workers today. Your pastors and teachers realize that the, the call to proclaim the gospel to you is an undeserved gift from God. It is a privilege. And I know that I speak for all the pastors when I say, and we hold in trembling hands the call that you've extended to us because we know how easily we could let it slip through our fingers by our own sinful behavior. And so we pray, God, keep us faithful to your word. Keep us faithful to you. And you realize when God does that, and He has, purely by grace, He's doing it not just for your called workers. I mean, granted, we're grateful for that. That's why I'm still in the ministry, because God has kept me qualified. But it's not just for my benefit. It's for your benefit. He 
because God loves you that much that he doesn't want anything to keep you from hearing and believing the powerful good news of God's love in Christ that we get the chance to share with you every single week. In a sense, it all boils down to this. Be because God knows that the Word works, He wants nothing more than for you to have pastors and teachers who share that Word faithfully with both what they say and how they live. May that always be the case here at Mount Olive and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends